We are honored to consider him a friend of AI and our students. So humbly, I would like to welcome Peter Kearns to the, to the stage. I'm not really a professional speaker, so I do need notes and my glasses. Um, but I'd like to, um, first I'd, I'd, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I live in Vancouver, Washington now. With, with my family, we've, we've been there about seven years. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to share my experiences in my past, uh, my past life. Um, when I, uh, I was born and grew up in New Jersey, out of whatever that means. And then, uh, it, and at the end of high school, uh, I wanted to go out to California and work on special effects because the special effects uh, was an inspiration to me. I, I, I really thought they were cool when I was a kid. And uh, especially the work of a, a man named Ray Harryhausen. Uh, I, I, understand, I understand he was a uh, PC, uh, uh, Portland Creative Conference speaker back in the 90s, by the way, and, uh, and this, is some of his, uh, this is some of his work, and special effects was really like magic. I saw this on TV, and, and it was like, wow, this is really cool. I'd like to, I'd like to be involved in this. I don't know how this, how this works, but it, it, it was like magic, and I really wanted to be part of that magic. So, in any way, in 1976, after I graduated uh, from high school, uh, I went to the California Institute of the Arts, which um, <clears throat> is about as far away from New Jersey as I could get without hitting water. Uh, and, um, and they had a work-study program at Disney, and then they told me that there was this movie being made by the man who made American Graffiti, George Lucas. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't really much of a movie at that point. Could we stop on this, could we stop on this frame for a second, this ugly-looking piece of film? In any case, uh, so they say, okay, well, if there's a movie being made by George Lucas, the man who made American Graffiti, and I really wanted to check that out, and I said, well, I'm, I'm gonna take stuff that I made on uh, film and splice it together, because back then, you have to remember that uh, there wasn't um, DVDs, uh, there weren't, wasn't even VHS, uh, there was nothing but film. So I had to take all of these pieces of film that I had uh, worked on because I wanted to have some kind of a demo reel so that I could show them what my capabilities were. Uh, so I met with uh, John Dykstra. We can proceed a little bit now. Uh, and he was the uh, supervisor on a movie at the time was called The Star Wars. Yeah. I don't know anything about this New Hope or anything. This was like... This is the first one, and there were no computer. There was one computer, the computer that operated some of these um, uh, models. Okay, stop for a minute. Uh, so, I got my reel together and uh, spliced it to showcase my talent. Uh, and I got an interview with John Dykstra, and so I lugged along my 16 millimeter projector, weighed about 50 pounds and my film and the take-up reel, and I set it up for him in the screening room, because uh, they didn't have a 16 millimeter projector there. They had 35 and this division. But so I brought my 16 millimeter projector in, and I started running it for him, and at every splice, the film broke. <laughs> now, to show you what a miserable experience that was, I found this little instructional film online that says the what happens when you're showing in the middle of the screening the movie. here's what to do to avoid too much annoyance to your audience turn off the projector keep calm and don't let the audience rattle you open the film gate to release the tension on the film flip open the three sprocket shoes and quickly but carefully remove the film from the sprockets wind the loose film onto the take-up reel lift the broken end of the film and place the new end under it Turn the take-up reel to make sure the new end is snug, then pull down the film from the feed reel, allowing yourself a little more than normal. Then start re-threading. Remember, this operation must be performed properly, so take your time. 
Never attempt to patch or fasten a broken film when a break happens, because you have already delayed the show long enough. <laughs> that, was, that was exactly what happened. And I was, I was, totally, I was totally mortified from the experience. And, 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 and after, after it was over, uh, the lights came up and Dykstra was sitting there. Um, gee. He, he wasn't very impressed, and he certainly wasn't impressed with my ability to splice film together. So I didn't really know what to do at that time, so I said, look, give, give me a chance. Let me work for you for a week for free. And at the end of that week, if, if it doesn't work out, you don't owe me anything. I'll just go away. No, no pay or nothing. But if you want me to stay on, then I'll, I'd love to work here. This is, this, is a, this is a great job. This is a great first job, you know. For, and, and they didn't have a lot of money to work with. That's why they were considering hiring hacks like me because we're, you know, we were cheap at the time and we had a lot of energy and not a lot of knowledge, but they said, well, this is a working, this is a working experience. You know, you, you, you get to learn about how to work on Hollywood movies. And, uh, and I had something to put on my resume. I actually didn't finish CalArts. I went there for like a year and a half because when this movie opportunity came along, I said, well, I'd like to work on this movie. Of course, my parents said, stay in school. I said, well, I'll go back to school after if I need to, but I think it would be better if I actually got a credit on a movie because I thought that might actually have a lot more to do with being, uh, getting a job in the future. So they said, okay, that's fine. And... Uh, and Dykstra hired me, and we can continue now a little bit. Uh, some pictures, that's me working on Star Wars when I was 19, and I didn't disappoint him. I, 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 I loved working on this movie. I came in early. I would go to sleep there so I wouldn't have to, uh, so I wouldn't have to come back and go back to work. In fact, I, the night crew painted my toenails black when I was asleep. And I, and I woke up in the morning and my toenails were black. And it's like, somebody said, well, who did it? And I said, well, a lot of people had access to ink, so it was kind of hard, hard to know. Stop. Um, one other thing, I was uh, on Star Wars. Uh, I was much skinnier than I am now. And uh, they said, hey, we want to we wanna shoot, we, we want to do this, this scene. So they put me in the C-3PO suit. And they took me out to the desert in the middle of Los Angeles, uh, out, out north of Los Angeles, uh, out in the desert. And they put me in the uh, uh, land speeder because they were trying to figure out how to make the land speeder um, look like it was levitated off the ground. It's, it's a hell of a lot easier to do something like that now. Uh, go ahead and stop. Or, yes, just hold on that for a second. Um, so uh, it, but what happened was when I, when I got to the land speeder, uh, I discovered it was a stick shift. <laughs> and I'm in the C-3PO suit, and I said, I don't know how to drive a stick. <laughs> so since nobody else fit into the suit out there in the desert, they put me in a, one of the, one of the uh, uh, workers, one of the people who, who was on the, on the shoot had a BMW with a stick in it. So they, they took me out and drove me around, showed me how to, how to, how to do that with their, you know, and I eventually, uh, I, I, I eventually got it figured out, so I wasn't stalling out the land speeder as I was driving it. <laughs> but in any case, um, because I fit into the suit, after the movie was over, uh, they, uh, they, they let me help Anthony Daniels uh, get in and out of the suit and, uh, and, and go to um, uh, the footprint ceremony. So I was, I was there at the footprint ceremony, uh, helping him get his footprint in the uh, in, in Grauman's Chinese Theater. So a lot of people said, "Wow, I've seen this this on TV before. I didn't know that was you." Yeah, and, and I did some other goofy things too in the suit. There's another picture of me. I was I was in the I was in the suit at a uh, at a drag race, and they had a they they, they had a uh, um, uh, what is it they they had a, a rocket car. Um, racing against a jet car, and they put me right out in the middle of that thing. And the engines just went boom, 
and, and I flew back like 20 feet <laughs> in this suit. So, but anyway, they liked me. They kept me on. Uh, after, after the movie was over, I, you know, was out doing uh, uh, freelance jobs after that. Um, so anyway, we, let's see, where am I on next? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so since then, I've worked on about 300 movies. Um, some of them were fun. Some of them were not so much fun. Some of them were terrible. Some of them were great, you know. But um, so anyway, I, w I wanted to sh share my my experience and 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 what I'm doing with some of the clips that I'm showing you is is how I came up with creative solutions to techniques that without a computer, you're, you're just making, making stuff up, you know, as you're going along. Uh, so the first one, we go to the next drawing. This, is, this was in fifth grade, and, and, uh, and I took this aptitude test, you know. They had pictures like this. This is about the best I could come up with for these cards that they were handing out. And they were saying, um, uh, you know, what, what do you see here? And they said, well, what's missing? What's missing from this picture? And I looked at it for a long time and I said, I don't know. So the guy started to put the card away. And I said, well, wait a minute. Don't, don't just put the card away. You, you said something was missing in this shot. What was it? And he said, oh, well, a shadow on the tree. And I said, oh. He said, well, there's the sun. There's the house. And the house has a shadow. But the tree doesn't have a shadow. That's what's missing. And I remembered that for, you know, from fifth grade on. And uh, so when I got a job on Star Wars, um, sometimes they gave me the freedom to, well, what would you like to, what would you like to do? And I said, you know, I, I'd like to maybe make up some shadows and interactive light. You know, nobody had actually thought about that at the time. And you know, it's a, it's, it's much different now. If, if anybody here, you know, works in CG, you know that, you know, you, you can get shadows and interactive light practically built in seamlessly in, into a scene. Back then, I had to like animate it frame by frame. So you have to excuse it. Sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's a little shaky, but um, the, the idea was to try to make, you know, some of these scenes more interactive. And, uh, and they went for that. Um, so we'll show, the, we'll show this clip from Empire and, and try to keep an eye on the shadows. <laughs> because that's, you know, you're, you're not really supposed to look at the shadows, but that helps to, um, to bring everything together, whether you, whether you realize it or not. So this is a scene from Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> And those, those shadows are there because this guy in fifth grade, you know, <laughs> made me crazy about what was missing from this, from this picture. I had, I, I had some other stories from uh, Star Wars, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go on. Anyway, the next, just show the uh, frame of the next picture coming up. Okay, let me stop there. This is a movie I worked on, I think, back in 1982, John Carpenter's The Thing. And <laughs> see, with the rays and everything coming out, nowadays there's like a, a program, a, a plug-in called Shine, where you can take just about anything and, and it'll make these rays coming out, okay? It's, it's a lot easier to do that now. What I did for this, and we can show the next picture, okay, go on. Go on to the next picture, and it was very difficult to get these things synced up to me. Um, and I'll show you how I how I did this. Okay, I had a I had a fish tank, and I put the name the word behind the fish tank. Okay, and there's the camera, camera, camera's photographing the fish tank, and 
and inside the fish tank, I put smoke so that it, it, it would create these rays coming out. And then to make the, to, to make the tidal reveal on, I had a piece of garbage bag plastic that was stretched over this canvas, this frame, this, this wooden frame. And behind the wooden frame, I had a light. And what I would do is turn on the camera, and I took a match, and I, I poked the match into places on the garbage bag plastic. And what happened was the garbage bag plastic started to open up. And as it opened up, it let the light through from, from, this, from this studio light, and it revealed the title. Plus, you know, you'll, now, now that you know how it was done, you'll say, oh, yeah, I, I see that. Uh, <coughs> I, I'm happy they bought the idea, you know. And, and never, I don't think I even ever told them how exactly I was doing it. But you have to remember, when you're not in the world with computers, you, you have to figure out all sorts of goofy things to try to make something work. So we can run the thing clip. So now that you know how it was done, and that also includes the spaceship. I included the spaceship. It, this is from the opening title sequence. It, it took many takes to get it to look halfway decent. In fact, one of the takes only opened up the letters NG. <laughs> and for, for everybody, NG, of course, means no good. So it's like we were watching that in dailies, and it's like, OK, well, that one's NG. <laughs> so I, I, I think through all of this, I'm, I'm looking for ways to um, to come up with creative solutions w without the computer, because the computers, this was 1982, and I don't think we, we got our first computer until like, well, we had a, uh, an accounting computer. I remember that. We had an accounting computer. It, it had, uh, well, what was it like, 1980? Well, OK. But, but it, it, all it did was um, it, it did accounting pretty. <laughs> Pretty terribly. It was a monochrome monitor, and I think it was like 5K memory or something like that. It was, it was, uh, and it took for, what's that? Yeah, dual floppies, you know. But we really didn't get into um, a digital technology uh, until 1993 or so, about 10 years later when prices started coming down, and it's like we, we had to do it because everybody was doing it, and, uh, and we had to get involved. Um, okay, now let me set up the next um, the next clip I have, which is from Beetlejuice, and people say, you know, well, wh what's your what's your favorite creative solution? What was your favorite shot? What you know? What what was your favorite solution to that shot? And I I thought about it for a moment, and I I thought, you know, there's this there's this shot in Beetlejuice where you know they have this miniature table which has the um, town on it. And uh, Adam, the guy's character name, is transported to that. He gets into this little miniature car. And, and then the miniature car goes off the table. It comes down. It lands and drives off into Beetlejuice's foot and burns up his foot, OK? So I mean, it sounds really simple. It sounds, well, just push the damn car off the table. It'll fall, land, and, and, uh, and, and drive off. Well, it, it doesn't do that, you know? It, it, it sounded really simple, but, you know, we'd take the car, push it off the table. It would just spin around, uh, um, you know. It, 
there, there was just no way that that was going to happen. So I came up with this idea. I said, the floor, the floor that it's going off onto is, um, it, it's, that's a flat. It's not actually on the floor. It's a, it's a, it's a flat. It was, it was taken uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the set. You know, sometimes when they shoot something on the set, then they go back, they take a piece of whatever was on the set so they can put it down for what's called an insert shot. So, so they had the floor, and we, I said, raise the floor up off the ground so I can get underneath it. And they said, okay, so we got the floor up about like this high. And I said, okay, now push the car backwards. So push the car backwards, and then when it reached a certain spot, I took a hammer and I banged it underneath the table, and the car flew up in the air. And I said, okay, now print this backwards. <laughs> and you'll see, it, you'll see it with this clip. And then I also did um, some, uh, uh, I just did it in slow motion a couple of times so you could actually see what, see what was going on. It was very, very quick, but you'll see. Okay, so let's go ahead and run that. <laughs> There it is. Oh. There you go. I'm telling you, honey, she meant nothing to me. Nothing at all. I now pronounce you a yeah, god. Yeah. And okay. Now. Yeah, we can we we can run it in slow motion. You'll see it the way it was, and then I did it, and then I ran it a little backwards so you could see how it was actually shot. This is still going forward now. Boom. I I I think they were really mystified that this actually worked. But there really wasn't any other solution. I mean, nowadays, if you did it digitally, you make the car in, in CG, and you can make it do anything you want. But back then, we had to deal with physics. <laughs> so, let me see. OK, well, I'm going to set up this, this next piece. This is, um, this is what I got an Academy Award for. And I never got an Academy Award for any of the visual effects that I worked on. But um, I, I, I had come up with a solution on some laser swords, uh, lightsabers, excuse me, on Return of the Jedi. And I was able to take that, which was, which was kind of an interesting technique unto itself, because I, I, I spent way too much money experimenting with stuff you know, to try to figure out things. Uh, so I never really made as much of a profit as we probably could have, but I, I really enjoyed coming up with things. Now, the problem with the lightsabers, and you know, I had done lightsabers on the other two films, but this is out in the desert, and I, I don't know how many of you people are, work on a computer, know what, a, know what an alpha channel is. You know, when, when you have something that's bright and they want it, Against the, against the bright background, he wanted a green laser sword, lightsaber. And the problem is, against the, a very bright background, when you try to put the, put the green in to the lightsaber, it, it washes out and it becomes just white. So they really, it's, we want these to be green. How are you going to make it green? Well, if you're doing visual effects, uh, you, you, you have what's called a holdout mat. And a holdout mat's usually like this big blobby thing, and we can run that and just stop on stop on it for a moment. Uh, well, here's this is the green lightsaber. Okay. okay now. Stop for a minute, okay? Now, this is what you kind of make when you are trying to keep the green. You, it, 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 it's what they call a holdout mat. Today they call it like a, uh, an alpha channel. 
where it separates something and it's able to put it against uh, a background. And you use black because it will hold out the background and then you put in a new image on top of it, which would be the green lightsaber. Well, the problem with that was that when you, when you get an edge on something, when it's all fluffy and, and, uh, and glowy like that, you, you, you'll get a black fringe. You try to put the sword in, you get a black fringe around it. So I go, well, what can I do? Because it doesn't look right with a black fringe. So I came up with this idea, well, instead of a, a black mat, what about a green mat? And then you just run a little bit and you see what basically we came up with, okay? So I made a green mat, and when you combine that with the background, you can put the laser so lightsaber on top of it, and any fringe is green. So it's exactly what you want. Now, the, the, the reason I mention this is because this gave me, this gave me this idea. Well, we can, make, we can make maps any color. We can make them green, we can make them red. We, can, we gotta find you know, other ways of using this technology. And what else can we do with it? Well, while I was making this film of mine, Trinity and Beyond, uh, I learned that there was this problem with old movies from the 1950s that old color negative uh, faded. And what happened was, um, okay, you know, let's stop here for a minute and we, we can run it. Um, what happened was when, uh, uh, when the film fades, you get what's called crossover. And what that is is you got blue shadows and yellow highlights. And if you try to take the blue out of the highlights or out of the shadows, um, then the highlights get even yellower. And if you try to make the highlights uh, a normal color, uh, then the shadows get bluer. So I thought, why don't we go ahead and run this? And you'll see. I thought, well, we could maybe make a, a yellow mat and, and combine that with the image and the yellow will take the blue and neutralize it and you get good color. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, this technique came just before the digital revolution. <laughs> and while I probably could have made a fortune off of this had the computer not come into being, because once the computer came out, you, you can do this anyway, you know? And not only that, while you're at it, you can clean up all the dirt too that's on it. So that was, my technique would have, would have been great if it had come out five or 10 years earlier. And I wouldn't be here, I'd be burning $20 bills in my mansion. <laughs> So, it humbled me. <laughs> anyway, bef before I show the last image, I, I just wanted to, um, you know, review some of these things. You know, it's like, cr creatively, I, I could have been turned down by Dijkstra. You know, he, he could have been upset at having to sit there and watch my demo reel break up. But I said, let me work for free for a week. That's a, that's a creative solution, you know, and, and it worked. You know, also, you know, it's, it's important that you, you can make mistakes, you know. The part, making mistakes is part of learning. And, and, and a lot of these goofy ideas, you know, come from making mistakes, but then, you know, realizing what you've done and how else you can, how, how else you can change it. Problem solving, and this is all comes down to problem solving. You know, I, I, I think that I've been a good problem solver and I like to tell people, they say, well, what do you think is the best thing I should do? I say, well, you know what? You should be a problem solver because people, you'll always have problems. <laughs> you'll work for a place. There's, there's almost no place you could work for where they don't have problems. And if you can solve problems, they'll keep you around, you know? Especially if you're a nice guy and, you know, you make everybody happy, and, you know? Um, another, thing, uh, another thing was that, you know, to me, change, can inspire creativity too, because we had a, a visual effects business that basically did photochemical work. I mean, I, I got I got jobs because I knew how to take 
the existing technology, for instance, wire removal. Well, you can remove wires nowadays on the computer. Could you do this before? I was, I was a guy that came up with this technique where I'd look in the optical printer and I had this really tiny um, brush and I would dip it in Vaseline and I would put it right between, you know, between the camera lens and, and the image that it was rephotographing. In fact, I, I got the name Mr. Vaseline for it. You know? <laughs> And and they'd always and they'd always, you know, call me over the intercom. Hey Pete, come on into the printer room. We got the Vaseline ready for you. <coughs> but anyway, so you know, we did our first digital shot in 1993 and uh, became a digital facility around 2000. You know, I and that was also around the time I started to decide I wanted to make my own projects because I felt that making things was probably better than being a service because the computer can make everybody a service organization and it's like, well, I don't want to compete against these young guys that grew up with a mouse in their hand. So I tried to come up with other, other ways. I made this documentary, Trinity and Beyond, and, and uh, you know, even though um, my dear wife said I spent too much money on it. <laughs> now, now, you say that now. Yeah, you say that now, uh, but anyway, that that's helped keep us going. You know, it's it's good to you know own uh, some uh, property rather than just being a service-oriented person. And I just wanted to show this last image because this is um, these are the guys that I worked with. There was a 40th anniversary of Star Wars this year. Uh, these are actually actually more people than actually worked on Star Wars because this is the original group who worked on Star Wars Empire and, and Jedi. And I'm right up there behind C-3PO. <laughs> so there, there I go. I got five minutes left. And if there's any questions, I don't know. You're supposed to do that. Uh, well, I'm helping you. Okay. That's all. Okay. So let's um, open this up for questions for Peter. Yes, ma'am, right there in the red. What are you working on now? Um, you know, I, I actually work at home now, now that you can work practically anywhere. I'm working at home, and right at this minute, I'm working on a, on a show called Bosch, which is made by... Um, Amazon, it's an Amazon production, and uh, they'll, and, and, it's, and it's really a bitch because it's, it's in 4K, and so I not only get these frames, you know, over the internet, but I get 4K frames over the internet, which are, are something like 60 megs of frame or something like that, it's, and, 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 it's, and it's 4K, and then they crop it down to, they, they crop out image around the side, and I have no idea why they throw all of that out if they're going to shoot this big, and then they take it down, <laughs> then they take it down to um, HD, and, uh, and that's what I'm working on. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing other work, too. I, I uh, um, you know, we, we, we sell our, our DVDs, books, and stuff like that online, so if you're really into it, the atomic bomb, that's where you go. Um, another question uh, yeah. for Peter? Yes, sir, you're right here in the front. How did you go about keeping up with dramatic changes in technology as you go along? Well, it wasn't easy. Uh, and you, you have to, and at the time, we had to do it kind of in steps. You know, we had, uh, like, I think I, I, I worked on a movie called Cliffhanger, and we had to, and and, and back then, uh, s scanning, for instance, was, was like $6 a frame. Now it's, now it's like 50 cents a foot, you know, which is 16 frames. So 50 cents for 16 frames. But back then it was um, $6 a frame. So where we had to have like a long piece of footage that eventually wound up on an effect shot, we had to make that, we had to do that optically. Uh, and, and so we were, see, we were building... Um, uh, together 
old technology and new technology because of you know the cost structure and, and, and it took forever. You know, I think it took us like five minutes a frame to shoot off onto um, onto film, which is pretty uh, pretty long. In fact, it took like five minutes a frame to scan a frame, and if the frame stayed on the scanner too long, it could burn a hole in it. <laughs> you know, it was it, it was that um, it was that's the way the technology was and how we had to uh, group them together. You know? I have a quick question. Did you learn to drive a stick in the desert in that suit in the BMW, or did they take you out of the suit and then you learned to drive and then put you back in the suit? They took me part way out of the suit. I want to see if some you, photographs if you of saw, that. If you saw that picture, they, they had the breastplate on me. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't want to take that off. You know, right. they, they had to keep me in that. Um, yeah, there was something else about the, the, the I, I had, and they made me go pick up Mark Hamill too, because because I was the low guy, low right. guy on the totem right. pole, you right. know. And and at the time, I was living at Cal Arts, and where they were shooting w was maybe ten miles to the west, you know, or to the east. Well, Mark Hamill lived in Malibu, which was like, you know, all the way, way far away. So I had to go pick him up, and then I had to go all the way back. And um, and he, uh, you, you maybe know this story. He he had been in an accident. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why when you see Empire Strikes Back, the first thing that happens is this, this big abominable snowman beats him in the face and knocks him off. And it's like basically because he had um, had uh, this accident and it changed his look, you know. In fact, he was grossing me out because they had a pin in his nose and he would just kind of push it back and forth like this. And it's like, oh, God, stop. <laughs> Any, uh, yes, sir, you in the middle. What, what are the challenges left, do you think, in special effects with all the technology we have that seems to make it seem easier? What are still some challenges left? Well, the challenges for me is to you know, completely figure that out. I, I originally came from a, what you'd call a 2D environment, and um, it's, it's a little, it's still difficult for me to visualize things in a three-dimensional environment. So, I mean, it's, that's, that's what other people are for. People that are good at what they do, people that are born with a mouse in their hand, and people that can definitely kick my butt on, you know, doing things digitally, so. And with that, we have to uh, thank Peter Coran for coming to the Creative Conference. Peter Coran, everybody. Thank you. I, 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 was, I was one of those people in a position where I could work on some big high budget films, um, but also I could work on some really cheap movies too. So it's like I, I ran the, the gamut of, um, well, we're, we're doing some shots on the next Indiana Jones, but also at the same time we're, we're working on RoboJocks for, uh, you know, or, or, or some movie that's, you know, made for 150 grand or something like that. So, um, but that's just from being an independent, you know, with my own company. At, at one point, ILM thought that somebody at ILM said, well, we think you have 15% of the business in town, which... Which is a lot, you know, considering that there's a lot of other companies. Because I was, I was trying to do whatever, whatever work I could, and especially if it was um, something that somebody else couldn't do. There's, you know, for instance, like there's a, what is that movie, um, Inner Space. There's a shot where a guy, you know, now nowadays, you know, it, it it happens a lot where you've got your sunglasses, and the crew will reflect in the glasses. And nowadays, it's a lot easier to do it digitally. But you know, that would be one of the things they say. Hey, can you get rid of the crew and the glasses? It's like nobody else would touch stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So.